Welcome to another episode of the iShots video tutorials. In this episode, we will be discussing how to simulate hardware using LabVIEW classes. When writing a LabVIEW application that communicates with hardware, there are times when you need to have the code functional even though you don't actually have the hardware in hand. This could be because of time constraints. For example, parallel software development must happen while the instrument is being shipped or backordered. Or you're presenting the software at a trade show and your sales department needs a working demo without having to carry all the hardware around. In any case, you have to figure out a way to develop your application and work around this problem. By designing your software around the use of LabVIEW classes, you can easily include hardware emulation capabilities right from the start. You do this by creating an inheritance hierarchy for your hardware in software and then using dynamic dispatching. Dynamic dispatching allows you to pass implementation of the hardware functions to either the actual software that communicates with the hardware or to a software simulated version of it. Now let's take a look at a typical example of how you would write code to call an Agilent 34401 DMM using the standard driver VIs provided by the manufacturer. We've created an example VI to help us out here. Here you can see the front panel of the VI, which does a couple of sim uh, simple steps. First, we initialize the instrument, return the instrument information, take a voltage measurement, and then clean up the instrument. If we run this, uh, this VI right now, it actually won't uh, work because we don't have the Agilent DMM uh, connected to, the, to our computer. So let's look at the block diagram. Pretty simple. It's a while loop which continuously runs. And every time we press one of these buttons, we either initialize the instrument, take a voltage measurement, uh, clean up the instrument, and stop the application. As you can see here, we're making direct calls to the instrument driver VIs, which we actually got from National Instruments website. In our case here, this particular driver is pre-installed with every LabVIEW installation. So uh, if you have LabVIEW on your system, you already have these installed. The problem with this implementation, as, as you can see, is that there is no way right now to uh, run the code without the hardware. Uh, unless we have the hardware, um, we will get errors. And as you can see, let's try running this. Initialize instrument, and we get a Visa error. And the application stops. If we wanted to... Uh, run this software or this application without the hardware we would have to do things like wrap this code in a case structure make it false or use a disable structure uh, we'd have to go in here wrap this in a disable again go in here wrap this in a disable structure or we would have to put um, one big disable structure of around all of these in other words, we'd have to do some uh, code modifications in order to disable all this hardware communication. And on top of that, we would have to uh, implement something in its place to return the code, uh, sorry, to return the voltage or some kind of signal that would otherwise be returned from the instrument. An alternative approach using classes would define a generic parent class called DMM this would have one child class called Agilent 34401 and another child class called DMM Emulator. Throughout our application, we will use the DMM class wire. On this DMM class wire, we will transport the child classes as needed. When our application makes a call to a VI, which is configured for dynamic dispatching. LabVIEW forwards the call to a VI specific to the class which is traveling on the wire, either the Agilent 34401 implementation or the DMM emulation. The parent DMM class really has no idea how to implement the functionality in each call. The actual obligation for fulfilling the implementation falls on the children. In this case, the Agilent Driver class or the Emulator class. Child VIs that implement the functionality of the parent are said to override the parent. You can choose to have a child override the parent or choose not to. If there is no override VI in the child class, the parent VI executes instead. 
Now let's take a look at a working example. We've modified our original code and changed it so that it uses classes. Here's the front panel again, only this time we've added a selector here. We can switch between DMM emulation or the actual Agilent 34401 uh, driver VIs. Let's take a look at the block diagram. As you can see here, we have the code looks slightly different. Uh, as we've mentioned earlier, we've created a parent class, which is the DMM class, and that's our main object wire that's going through our entire application. Our selector, basically what it does is it switches between one class and the other. LabVIEW does automatic type conversion for the classes here, so we don't need to do any special um, conversion to be able to wire this child class to the parent wire. LabVIEW handles that automatically. Again, here we have the take voltage measurement section, and in the idle case, sorry, in the, in the false case, when we're not taking a measurement, we actually read the voltage. And this, this time, it's not from a shift register, but from within the class uh, using a, uh, a method VI. And we finally have the cleanup portion. If we take a look at the project, if we look at the uh, DMM parent, you see that we have the init VI, we have the cleanup VI, and we also have the query voltage VI. If we look at the children, you'll see that we have also a cleanup VI, an init VI, and a query voltage VI. So one of the requirements for dynamic dispatching is to make sure that you have whichever VI is dynamic dispatched. In our case, for example, it would be the init VI, that we have another VI in the child class with the same name. If we go back to our code and we double click on the init VI, Lavi presents us with a dialog because it knows that it's a dynamic dispatch VI. So it's asking us right now, which VI do we want to look at? Do we want to look at the parent VI, which is highlighted in this case, or do we want to look at the emulator VI or the Agilent 34401? Let's take a look at the parent. Double clicking on that will open the parent. On the diagram, we don't uh, see much here, but we do see what we do see is that the visa references passed into the class data. The reason for that is that we, I've decided in my implementation to have the visa resource name data as part, as part of the parent class. And in order for the children to read and write that value, they actually have to call into the parent to read that data. So I'm populating the parent data here. If we open this guy up, we'll see that all we're doing is just populating the data of the parent class. We go back to the parent and look at the data of the parent, which is called DMM control here, you'll see that it contains the visa resource name, instrument info, which we'll populate later, and the last voltage reading, which again, we'll populate later. Going back to the init VI, if we open this guy up and go into the actual hardware driver, we'll see that there's quite a few more things happening here. We actually make a call to the parent, to have a visa resource populated correctly. It'll actually make a call to the parent VI, the equivalent parent VI called init.vi. So once that's populated, it'll read the data from the parent, the reference, initialize the hardware, write it back into the parent, and also does a query instrument info. If we open this guy up, we'll notice that it too is a dynamic dispatch VI. So it can actually, it actually has a parent implementation and also a child override. So if we look at the parent, we'll see that it actually performs the query. It does a write and a read and returns some data. And again, we'll, we're populating the, uh, the data of the parent. The reason why I've decided to let the parent implement this and not the children is because uh, I'm making an assumption here that most of the instruments that I will have in the future will support this star IDN command. If uh, a child class does not support this, I can down the road decide to create a child VI that will override this function. Definitely can do that down the road. But for now, I feel comfortable with letting the parent implement this.
if we go back into this query instrument info, if we go into the emulator, notice that there is no implementation in this class here, so it's grayed out. If we go into the emulator, we'll see that there is no query performed. However, I would like to populate the instrument info with something. And in this case, it is just some text that says, hey, I'm a DMM emulator. And if we decide to use that instrument info down the road, let's say in our uh, test reports or somewhere like that, we'll know that this data came from the DMM emulator, not from the actual instrument. And if we go down the line here, we'll see that we have other three instances where we can open that up and go into the actual instrument implementation and we'll see that we read the visa ref num configure for dc voltage take a single point reading update our internal uh, data buffer and also output the value now the reason why we do this is so that we can conveniently when we're not taking a voltage reading we can actually just read the value of the voltage from the parent data so we can just read what we had from there. So we can use the parent class to store the last voltage reading, and we don't have to sort of implement that in, in our application. We go back to the query voltage and open up the emulator for this guy. We'll see that our implementation for the emulator is to just generate some random numbers, a random sort of noise jitter, on top of a five. Okay, so going back to the cleanup, we have here, which actually closes the instrument reference and makes a call to the parent um, so that uh, the parent can perform its cleanup. And if we open up this guy and look at what the parent implementation does, we'll see that all it really does is just reset the data to its default values. The actual closing of the instrument happens in the implementation of the children. If we go to the emulation, we'll see that all it does, it just makes a call to the parent. It doesn't need to do anything special here. And finally, we have the read instrument info, which all it does is it reads the instrument info, which it stores in the parent data store. And that is just reading the data from the parent. There's definitely uh, some hierarchy here as far as which VIs sort of get overwritten in the children and which don't. We have the ability to immediately create some simulation where we didn't have that before. Now, um, if we go to the front panel and run this guy, if we run it in the Agilent 34401 mode, which is actual hardware communication and initialize the instrument, we get an error just like before. Run it again. Now we're in emulation mode. We can initialize the instrument and it returns us, hey, I'm a DMM emulator. I can take a voltage measurement and I can get back some data every time I click it. And then cleanup instrument uh, resets the data and closes connection to the instrument. And that's how we basically do software emulation uh, using classes in LabVIEW. Now, of course, uh, this implementation allows us to do uh, a lot more than just emulation. Uh, as you can see here uh, with the children classes, if later on down the road we have problems with the 34401 and we don't have it available and we decide to pull another uh, DMM off the shelf and use that in place, the benefit of this design is it does not require any top-level hardware uh, software changes. The init, query, cleanup, and so on will still be there, does not have to change. All we really need to do is create a new class, new child class, call it, you know, Keithley ABC DMM, and go into our project and add a new class and make that a child of the DMM parent and go in there and implement the override VIs for the cleanup, the init, and the query voltage. Thank you for watching this video tutorial. All the code shown in this tutorial is available on the VI Shots website. 
Hopefully this was helpful and gave you some ideas that you can use in your own LiveView software development. Bye for now.